Hello and welcome to another episode of Sales Ops Demystified. Today we're joined by Chris Santos, who has over 10 years sales ops experience at companies such as DocuFine, Quantcast, and now at Pluralsight. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to kick off with the first question. Um, how did you initially get into sales ops? Because I can, can see from your history, you did have time in business in different roles. So how mm -hmm. did you make that that journey? Yeah, so um, unlike a lot of people who end up in sales ops because they either started in finance or in consulting, I actually, uh, you know, I never thought or saw myself as actually joining the corporate world. Uh, when I was in college, I wanted to be a diplomat because nice. I really wanted to change the world. And I thought that, you know, I, I could change the world <laughs> to become a better place. Um, and I wanted to be a diplomat. And that's what I kind of studied to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I joined the military. And I was a naval officer for four years. And that's where I actually started working in strategy and operations nice. in a military setting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of people get a little bit confused and say, how, how are the two worlds um, connected? And they're extremely connected. Mm -hmm. So much because, you know, the, the, the areas and the concepts of strategy and operations were basically created in the military. And um, so much that actually I spent a lot of my time, I was assigned to a training unit. And we actually hosted a lot of training sessions with business people. Uh, about team uh, building activities, leadership, strategic thinking, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, agile methodology, you know, um, a lot of those concepts. And actually, it was those business people that started triggering their interest in me because they said, have you ever considered leaving the military mm -hmm. and moving to business? Because we probably needed someone like you. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of made me very curious about it. And, you know, uh, I always wanted to live abroad and I was spending some time abroad with the military and having exposure to that. And, um, you know, uh, I came to Ireland to visit my sister who had been living here. And then the business world here is so dynamic and there are so many companies looking for people with my background in terms of, you know, multilingual, etc., that it was quite easy to, to get a job. And this was back in 2008. So at the time of the crisis, and I started in kind of a sales role uh, mm -hmm. because it was the easiest back then. And then I realized that I really wanted to spend time in the in the behind the scenes. You know, where do we go next? What is the next market? And those things. So um, I was given assignments that were not exactly sales related. They started giving me SWOT analysis because I was mm -hmm. so curious about it. Um, at the time, you know, I was working for Allianz, a subsidiary of the uh, of Allianz, the insurance company. Yeah. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in a subsidiary that was growing outside of Europe. And, you know, I worked um, with Latin America and Africa and, you know, it appealed so much to my prior experience of working in international relations and diplomacy, et cetera. And so I just got really interested and um, I just decided it's time to find a job in an operations, you know, because that's that's mm -hmm. my passion. That's where I'm really, really, I really like working with salespeople, but I like being behind the scenes with them to make them more effective than actually being myself a seller. Um, so that's why I moved to um, operations. And that's when I moved to BMC Software. So a very well-established company mm -hmm. uh, where I learned a lot a lot, you know, from from my manager at the time, who was really important, uh, from my colleagues who were a lot more experienced in sales ops than I was in business. And, um, I, you know, uh, it was a great school, but it was a very well established company. And I really like kind of getting my hands dirty and help scaling businesses. And obviously, BMC was already a pretty well established company. And, and you know, that's, that's how I made the move to other companies that kind of um, were less established, less mature. And, and that's how I, you know, developed my career. And yeah, after, you know, I've had experiences with at Quantcast, and then four years at DocuSign, which was definitely a very special experience and yeah. very successful. And now here at Pluralsight to, to help with the same, scaling the business internationally and, and making it successful. So how do, with it four years in the Navy? Yep. And then how many years selling? 
uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years, and then the rest operate. Well, the rest, operations. yeah. It's cool. Yeah. And then in the army, we've had no one else on the podcast who has military service, so it's super interesting. The the work that you're doing today in sales ops and Poralsight, were you doing similar things in the in the operations in the navy? Um, the concepts are the same. So the strategic thinking is always about. Um, uh, having been with with several companies so far, some companies make the mistake of only dealing with the tactical day to day, but they never have a strategic plan. So I would say the the what the Navy and the military really gave me was you always need to have a plan, and sometimes it's plan A and B and C because you need to be agile mm -hmm. because sometimes what you expect and you know especially in business uh, financial modeling you know is very interesting, but you probably need to take into account that you probably need scenario one, two, and three, because sometimes circumstances change. And in the military, circumstances can change. And the stakes are very high, right? We're talking about lives and, and very serious things. So I think for sure, the concepts I learned there, you know, the agility, the uh, kind of uh, being resourceful, like getting things done because mm -hmm. the stakes are so high that you have to get things done. Otherwise, you're not progressing. You're not being successful. Lives are at risk. And I oftentimes tell my teams when they get worried about things that, you know, it's not lives that are at stake. But I, I the kind of basics of how I work, I do apply still my military concepts because it's like we need to get things done. We need to get this done and it needs to be done. Now there is a sense mm -hmm. of urgency. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was my military background. Maybe it was my sales background. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a sense of urgency that sometimes I, I see in other groups, in ops groups or in finance groups that are do not have the same sense, sense of urgency. But um, for sure, the strategic thinking, the, um, the all, all kind of, a sense of not always being, I'm never entirely happy with how things are. There's always something that we can improve. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm naturally unhappy with how things are, even if they are doing really well. But I always think we can improve a little bit more. There has to be improvement mm -hmm. because especially in tech, that's why I, I really moved away from insurance and financial services and moved to tech. It's so fast paced, it's so competitive. Mm -hmm need to be always on the forefront. And, and that's definitely something that I take from the military. You need to always be ahead of your enemies, you know, um, always innovating. So, um, and, and you always think about resourcing and planning and logistics. So it's the same here in, in, in sales operations. It's the same. Always thinking about how many sellers we need. How are we going to make them successful? How are we going to train them? In the military, it's the same. It's exactly the same. The concepts are um, are the same. I don't I don't see any difference. Almost honestly, um, <laughs> and I mean this in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could write a book, couldn't we, about how translating learnings in the military to sales? But that's probably yeah. a separate podcast. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. um, so, what do you think makes an awesome sales ops person? Um, someone who challenges the status quo um for sure mm -hmm. uh someone who obviously has opinions and is able to read a situation and make an opinion about it but also someone who listens i do think that is important for ops people to listen mm -hmm. to the business and the units that they support uh, I, oftentimes I come across, uh, you know, ops and strategic people that never listen. They just have an idea and, and go with it. And for example, I, I also have ideas of my own and perspectives on certain ways of doing business, but I always listen because the product is not the same. The company is not the same. The values might not be the same. So you always need to listen uh, because at the end of the day, companies are made of people. So as ops and strategy people, people, we need to influence a lot if we want to get things done. So you obviously need to listen to your stakeholders and your partners and, and make sure that you speak in a language that they understand. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you don't get anything done. So I would say that from having kind of um, that, you know, inherent quality of 
getting things done and being knowledgeable and having ideas, but also being able to listen to mm -hmm. other people's. Because I've seen that ops people sometimes, actually oftentimes, the ops department becomes the unbiased department in a company. The one that doesn't have any dogs in the fight, that all we want is to drive efficiency mm -hmm. and revenue, regardless if it's sales or marketing driven. We're not driven by that. We want what's best for the company. So I would say it's it's definitely listening and always challenging, you know, asking questions. So listening, asking question and questions, um, challenging the status quo and mm -hmm. saying, did it work, the playbook that we've been using? Has it been working? Has it been successful? And even if it has, how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. How can we overcome? So yeah, so it's a combination of being active, but also listening yeah. to people, talking to other departments, because I think it's uh, in ops, we do hold the keys to a holistic view of the business combining all elements that it's not just, you know, the pipeline and the lead that comes in, it's how it's actually moving through the mm -hmm. funnel. It's how the order is put together. So it, it's a, it's different things. Yeah. Um, on the status quo piece, have you got a, a, an example or a story of when you've done that and it's led to, a, a, where you've challenged something that was currently happening and you challenged that and changed it and then it led to better result? Um, you know, I would say uh, it, I've come across this situation a few times, which is um, precisely because I've been working for long with American companies, right? Is um, them coming to terms that when you decide to go to Europe or internationally, that the playbook, even for a very well and successful, well established and successful company in the US, that playbook might not actually play the mm. same way might not get the same results when you go to Europe because people are like, oh, in EMEA, you know, uh, we're going to use the same. Well, let me tell you something. Europe is several countries. And I, I always use the analogy of uh, tea with milk, which sounds very appealing in UK and Ireland. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I'm a Southern European. Tea with milk, not, not an appealing idea to me. So the same input you know, gets a different output. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes um, challenging that, it is a challenge because you need to talk to your, uh, sometimes your bosses and managers back at HQ in the US mm -hmm. and, and explain to them that, hey guys, the, the scoring model that we have in place, it's not going to work here. We're going to have to tweak it or uh, a certain way of um, prospecting, right? On the sales development side, here, if we decide to go to Germany, for example, we're probably going to have to tweak the way we write our emails. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that 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 is an example, especially with my experience working with uh, uh, American HQ companies. Oftentimes, my first challenge is not, you know, it's not like I get re um, uh, pushback. He's precisely telling we're going to have to probably be uh, cognizant that we we might have to customize our playbook to something different yeah. to uh, appeal to a, a European audience if we're talking about mm -hmm. Europe or to um, a Brazilian audience, you know. Um, for example, uh, recently we working with Brazil and being very close to that culture, obviously, it's a culture that is very driven by oral communication. So emails are not very successful. So when you go back and you explain to your US HQ that, we're going to have to get phones up and running because in Brazil, it's all about talking over the phone. Mm -hmm. For them, it was kind of, really? They can't do emails? Well, they can, but it's not culturally mm -hmm. um, culturally and business-like, right? It's not as successful. So if we yeah. want to be successful, we're probably going to have to get some phones up and running. So that that is an example, yeah. So were Quantcast, DocuSign, and Pluralsight all HQ'd in the US? Yes, correct, yes. Yeah. So you've had to manage yeah. that. I mean, you must be pretty, pretty good at doing it now, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. It started with BMC, also HQ'd in, in, in the US. So, yeah, I'm pretty used to uh, all my managers so far have been based out of the US. Yeah. Um, so for, for 10 years, yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, do you think that sales experience is necessary to succeed in sales operations? Uh, not really, no. I think it makes it easier uh makes it faster for you to understand the sales side so if you has if you have prior experience in sales you you know the language you know what makes them tick 
Uh, and I found that because I, I worked in sales, I knew their sense of urgency there. I could understand better and faster once I moved to an ops role. Uh, having worked and having team members in my in, in the teams that I've managed that never had a sales background and came, they struggled initially with, oh, it's like they want things for yesterday and, you know, sometimes adapting your language to make sure that, hey, you need to be straightforward with, sa with salespeople, with sales leaders, you know, they have this way of working and you're not going to mm -hmm. change them. And actually, we want them to be that. We want them to be kind of stubborn and we want them not to accept the no. That's exactly, that's what makes yeah. them a good seller, right? So I would say it's not a critical. It just makes it easier in the beginning for you to um, create a relationship with them. Just makes it yeah. faster. That's it. But I don't think it is a critical um, experience. And, but, and so that's what you experienced yeah. when you started, when you moved over, you found it. I didn't easier. have, yeah, I didn't have kind of, let's call it the, a cultural clash because I knew where they were coming from. So it was quite, quite easy to adapt to that. Whereas mm -hmm. I've, I've seen other people kind of um, uh, taking longer, let's put it like that, and trying to come to terms if that was the right choice or not. But for example, I do think that whatever, uh, whatever background you have, that if you are supporting sales, that you should do the same sales certification that they do. So you understand what methodology, and that's something that mm -hmm. I always enforce my team members, is that whatever methodology, whether it's Sandler, Challenger, that you do that as well, so that you understand where they're coming from, and that you also understand the value of the product you're selling. Because if you, you don't need to be an expert, right? Because you're not putting order together and discussing pricing with customers, but you need to understand what the value of the company, the value proposition, the USPs are. Because that way you also think better on how to strategize uh, around the sales teams and how to make them more efficient. If you don't know what product you, your company is selling and you don't know the values, then no, you're not doing a great job. It's going to be much harder <laughs> to assist and be a good sales ops partner. Cool. Yeah. But to know that stuff, you don't have to have actually gone and sold it. No. If you can. No. Got it. No. Okay. No. Uh, let's shift over to technology. Uh, so right now, Pluralsight, what are you currently using? Uh, I think right now the tech stack across several SaaS companies is pretty much the same. Yeah. You know, you need to get your CRM. So I'm agnostic. Obviously, I've been using uh, past the advertising Salesforce for several years. <laughs> That's the CRM system I've seen being used the widest. But whatever it is, you need to have your CR CRM platform in place. Uh, you need to have, obviously, a marketing automation tool. Again, agnostic mm -hmm. to that. I've worked with Eloqua, Marketo, you know, HubSpot. Um, depends on the company. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have in place <clears throat> a lead distribution engine. That's definitely something that I've seen uh, as being critical. And again, mm -hmm. it depends, but a lead distribution engine to streamline. So you don't just have lead queues. Um, set up in your CRM, but you actually have a lead distribution engine so you can turn on and off. Mm -hmm. You can push leads into certain individuals. You can, you know, you know, you can customize the lead assignment much more so efficiently and faster. Would that be custom built or would is there? No, there are, there's, you know, again, I'll pass the hour. NC Square is definitely something that, uh, it, yeah, Pluralsight has and DocuSign yeah. also had. So cool. it's, it's quite powerful. And then any sort of inside sales tool. So either inside sales or outreach have definitely been the ones that I've been that I've become familiar with over the years. And they kind of provide a similar service with you know mm -hmm. with differences and both being very powerful, but again, um, also important tools to uh, make the work of the sales development or business development, whatever you want to call, more efficient and you can track metrics, you know. How long is it taking? You know, how many calls you're placing? You know, all those metrics are, are very important to track. Um, so there's a few, um, you know, a lot of companies use discover.org to, 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 to get kind of mappings of organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, traction hierarchies is also another tool that is very useful, especially once you start scaling your business and your sales organization and you have certain AEs looking after a certain group of accounts. And then in other regions, you have another AE and kind of making sure that the AEs connect together and they're able to see directly in 
in the CRM who owns what and mm -hmm. if there are open opportunities. I've definitely seen that working really well. Um, what else? Um, a, a CPQ system, critical. So uh, a system that allows you to place orders that allows the sales team to self-serve and get the SKUs they want, you know, in a faster and those automated approval workflows mm -hmm. in terms of discounts. Um, what does a uh, SPQ stand for? Um, it's, uh, I think it's, oh my God, it's something, uh, something quoting. So it's, it's to allow to quote. So mm -hmm. Aptus is a popular tool, for example, but there are, there are others out there in the market, cool. uh, that offer the same type of services. And obviously, I mean, I worked there for, for four years, but an e-signature company is quite critical nowadays. So yeah. obviously, yeah. DocuSign is really good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, Pluralsight does use DocuSign. And yeah. obviously DocuSign was using DocuSign and I was yeah. using DocuSign before I joined DocuSign. So an e-signature company that makes sure that whatever orders the sellers are placing are immediately signed by customers, that is critical. And that yeah. should be embedded in your entire contract, you know, contract order life cycle yeah. um, to, to streamline the process. So yeah, if, no, if yeah. Well, that was one of the first things I asked Pluralsight. You're using an e-signature solution, right? Because that's that shows that you're invested in making your sales processes as efficient as possible. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump into the DocuSign sign experience because I can imagine over that three to four years, they would have grown pretty substantially. So when you did join, how many people were, were there in the, I guess I think it was EMEA sales team, and then how many people were there when you left? Um. Uh, very few. Uh, we were probably all together in outside of the US. So DocuSign was already pretty big in North America, obviously. Here, we were probably 50, uh, l probably 30 here in Dublin and 20 people in London. So it was very small. I joined DocuSign in the year of all acquisitions, as we kind of mm -hmm. say. Uh, DocuSign made uh, se several, three acquisitions internationally. So it grew a lot in in a very short period of time and then it scaled uh, you know past the acquisitions then it naturally grew a lot um in the core so when i left we had uh, hundreds of people just in dublin hundreds of them so um you know it, 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 docusign is public so uh, it's not a uh, it's not uh it's it's publicly available that um, at the, when when the new fiscal year was launched, uh, it it represented international represented seventeen percent of the company's revenue. When I started, it was two percent. So it was a pretty aggressive growth and and, mm -hmm. and and an amazing experience, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, how was that having to bring in, I guess, sales resources from other acquired companies into your team and onboard them on the process? Yeah, you, you know, it's always complicated right because you're again as i said you're dealing with people and people you know that had a certain company or corporate culture but i have to say i worked with all of them uh and i was very fortunate to have really good experiences with the sellers that i worked with and, and create a connection but precisely because i listened to them uh, you know, whenever, hey, you're going to Paris and meet the team, we did, you know, the sell and integrate them into some new manager or something like that. Uh, I was very fortunate that I had really sensible and experienced people on the other side. Um, but also, I, I guess I just listened to them and they felt that they had, that they could voice whatever concerns they had. And mm -hmm. at the same time, DocuSign did have a very kind of open culture that we want, you know, we made the acquisition, we want to make it successful and, and the results are there to show. So, um, but yeah, but again, I would say it's very important that you listen, that you just don't go there and force things upon people because you can force them, but there's a way of being more, um, you know, you can influence rather than impose and you, yeah. you know, um, I guess the military trained me well in terms of influencing people mm -hmm. without them feeling that they're being pushed, nice. even if I am pushing on something. Yeah. Um, now, I didn't hear much allegiance to any tech tools, but if you had to choose a favorite and you can't choose DocuSign. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> DocuSign would definitely be one mm -hmm. of the favorites. Um, uh, well, I would say that it's favorite one. Um, I have to say, based on on some of the things I've been, I think the the a gamification tool 
So when I mentioned the inside sales, you know, a tool that the inside sales business dev can use, mm -hmm. gamification. So kind of, um, it's, um, uh, you know, there there's a few out there in the market. Uh, gamification creates a sort of competition, healthy competition within the sales development organization where you can, you know, it's basically you're showing the leaderboard of mm -hmm. who makes the biggest amount of calls, who creates more opportunities, and you get music, and you get videos, and they choose. And, you know, we, we need to be aware that a sales development organization is mostly comprised of young people. You know, this is their first job. So you need to make sure that the mm -hmm. environment is cool and fun because the job can be hard. You know, you need to clean up data and deal with sales um, um, attitudes, etc. So creating a gamification and having a gamification tool and getting that hype, you know, in the office with the music going on, with the competition of who's the best, it drives results, believe it or not. So I've, in the past few years, I've become a big fan of gamification tools, mm -hmm. uh, of can gamification. You, can you so Inside Sales has it as yeah. a native. Um, so it's good. And I've, I've, I've seen it up and running. Um, Ambition is a small company and I passed the advertising here. Great tool. Uh, and 1111 is also another one, mm -hmm. but for sure Ambition, I, I've seen it as a very cool interface sure. uh, with, uh, with videos. So for my colleagues out there, and if they're considering gamification, yeah, have a look at Ambition, a small company, but definitely worth, um, and integrates with a lot of, you know, with Outreach, mm -hmm. which has become quite popular as well. So it's it's really cool, the interface. Are, are you guys using Ambition at the moment? Uh, we use it at DocuSign, yes. Cool, awesome. Um, okay, moving on. How do you currently deal with data quality and how does your role interface with the CRM owner? Yeah, so data quality is a, an issue, I think, for a lot of companies, right? Um, I think uh, the, the first thing is there should definitely be a data quality owner that, you know, can, can sit in sales ops, can sit in IT. I'm not, I don't have a personal, you know, as long as it works, as long as there are initiatives around the clock almost. So... Uh, that it's not kind of an afterthought that, mm -hmm. oh, if things are, are looking really bad, then we do some data cleanup. No, it needs to be a constant, as in someone needs to be monitoring, monitoring, you know, how accounts get created, what standards they need to abide to. Um, you know, a big struggle is to find there is no such thing, and at least I'm proven wrong. Uh, I haven't been proven wrong yet, but there is no such thing as a perfect data provider for North America and international data. Uh, I've seen across and talking with colleagues in the same area, they all struggle. Uh, it's very difficult to find, you know, even the likes of <clears throat> DNB. It's very good in terms of North American data, but once we go internationally, mm -hmm. especially on, on smaller companies or even kind of mid-sized companies, the data is not good. The hierarchies are broken. So data is very, very important. So it should be, and I interact a lot. Um, here, I'm, I'm pretty new at Pluralsight, so I'm still trying to um, understand. But in the past, I've always worked very closely. I didn't have myself the mandate, and thank God, because I, I have other things to worry about. But obviously, um, you know, giving suggestions of local data providers for core markets, um, for example, in Europe, you know, um, there are some companies out there that have become very specialized in certain um, countries and you should partner with them and precisely have a data quality team that is constantly driving initiatives around data enrichment, data cleanup, deduping, all of that. It should be a constant mm -hmm. uh, because data is critical right for insights and for the work of any ops person and any decisions on go to market but if the data is dirty your your insights might be also mm -hmm. incorrect right you're not looking at the right trend so I, I i think it's critical um and and oftentimes um data quality is not top of mind for companies and it should because it can be um your differentiator um in the marketplace in terms of uh, getting the right um, insights out of the mm -hmm. business. 
if the data is wrong, your your conclusions are wrong as well. Mm -hmm. So taking more of a preventive approach, uh, so it's like doing exercise to prevent getting ill versus taking some pills after you've got ill. Is that a good analogy? Yes, for sure. sure. Uh, you know, and and again, I go back to my military roots. He's like, you should plan for the unexpected. And actually, I would say the best sales ops person is the one that doesn't just react to what is going on, is that we're able to predict something that might happen. Uh, because, you know, and, and actually, sales ops people most time, oftentimes are in charge of forecasting, right? With the sales leaders. So you should be pretty good at forecasting the future in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at trends and then you add some qualitative inputs into it, you can actually say, you know what? If we continue this way, our sales cycle will get longer. If we continue this way, our win rate will go down. So I, I would say the perfect sales ops person is precisely the one that not just reacts to what is going on, mm -hmm. you kind of predict a little bit the future. Oh, just writing that down, not just reacting. <laughs> and, I, and it's not it's not magic. It's literally science and data. You just identify the trend and then with, you know, because that's the thing, you, you look at trends and the data and you want some qualitative inputs because you're there, you're with the reps and you know what's going on and then you can make, you can infer a, a, a scenario for the future. Or maybe, hey guys, if we continue this way, we might go, as I said, we might see a sales cycle going up or we actually might see a sales cycle going down or our retention rates will decrease if we continue this way. And mm -hmm. I think that's that's uh, why why sales ops is so important is to precisely um, anticipate uh, challenges or anticipate um, and and um, identify opportunities for growth before they even get you. Um, and 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 that I mean that's why I love ops so much is precisely the ability to be almost like an oracle mm -hmm. of uh, <laughs> of stuff you know. Uh, I don't want to, to. I don't want to be just telling you what's going on because that's obvious. I want mm -hmm. to tell you what might happen, for 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 the better or for worse. Yeah. So seeing the future. Yes. Um, and what do you? What would you say is the biggest challenge in your role? Um, I wouldn't say the challenge. I, I would actually say the most exciting thing is that it's, and at the same time, it ends up being a challenge. Is that you need to be very cross-functional. Uh, and cross-departmental, that we can't work in a silo and just see from one perspective, is uh, precisely that, it, it, as I said, it becomes a challenge, but also the most exciting thing about this is the fact that you're going to have to work with people that have very different ways of thinking, right? You're going to have to work with finance who are completely um, plugged in a different way to sellers. Uh, and you're going to have to work with marketing and they tend to be more creative, you know, and all of that. And sometimes you're going to have to work with product and engineering. And uh, I think it's navigating all these departments and looking from it in a holistic way. So you're almost like looking at everything. And and yeah, that that is kind of the biggest challenge. But for me, it's also the most interesting thing. Uh, and as I said, it's we we become the kind of impartial, unbiased department that kind of gets everything that overall view and say, yeah, if we do this, we're going to have to, you know, work alongside everybody to get to the best, which is at the end mm -hmm. of the day, is making the company successful and driving revenue, which is what I'm always thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> making the so, company successful. So, so right now, the the departments you're interfacing with, uh, marketing, obviously sales, customer success, yeah, and yeah. finance. Uh, the main ones, yes, I would say, yep, the main ones. And then ones. any others that you'd have to uh, IT, with? yeah, okay. IT would yeah. also be obviously to with the dependencies regarding, you know, the CRM platform integrations on systems that have an impact on sales. Um, IT would also be a department I, that I work with on a regular cool. basis, yeah. And second to last question, if you had to choose a single metric to judge your sales reps by, what would you choose? The sale, sales reps? Yeah. I, I mean, their ability to hit target and uh, their forecast accuracy. That's okay, very that's basic two. in terms of, 
I'm very basic in terms of measuring the, the sales reps. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's their ability to hit their, their target and their ability to forecast accurately, for sure. So right now, sales reps are achieving their own, they're forecasting that for their own pipeline. Yeah, cool. their ability to forecast, to, to be able to make... Uh, and I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding in a way, but I'm not because that's how they are also measured in, in the company they work for. But um, for sure, their kind of insights of how they run their business, uh, because, you know, sales ops puts out together a lot of insights for the AEs and dashboards. And how is it that they think about the business? You know, uh, how how are they structuring their territories? Because we give them their territories, but then the management of the territories, it's up to the AE to decide, right? What accounts they should be looking after. We keep, you know, in, in some ways, we're giving them hundreds of accounts, um, you know, and we might even develop an account scoring model that helps them out. But in the end, it's their decision, right? Mm -hmm. They are the CEOs of their own business. That's and a really interesting point. Sorry to jump on that. That's super interesting. And no one's brought that up before. Mm -hmm. But looking at the salespeople as essentially being their own CEOs and their own profit and loss and their own forecast. That's super interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, um, it's funny. Uh, I've worked in the past with uh, um, sales managers that had this attitude that which I completely agree with is you're the the C the AEs and the sellers end up being the CEOs of their little company right so you have a lot of teams that support you in your day to day they are not alone but you're the one making the decision so look at what you have available and make a decision don't expect someone else to uh, make that decision for you mm -hmm. um, and you know if they actually pay attention to the metrics they're given and the feedback they're given by sales ops and their customer success people and their AMs and, you know, whomever is working, you know, the pre-sales consultants, they can actually make really good decisions, but they need to be the ones making them and, you know, thinking strategically about it. Um, and I talk with a lot of AEs um, and I always say, you know, take, take time in your calendar to actually think about how to run your business don't don't let it run like on its own because mm -hmm. you might be lucky to land a big deal and make a ton of money but you might also not be one of those lucky ones so you need to um think about it and i'm saying it out of experience mm -hmm. take your time to think how to uh, strategize your territory because nobody's gonna do, do that for you, for you. No. no um even if we develop as i said the scout scoring mm -hmm. models and all of that but you're the one talking to the customers. Yeah, not Harsh, us. Harsh but true words for the sales, for the AE. Um, okay, finally, who uh, taught you what you know or is there a person who's guided you the most in respect to sales operations? Um, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to have had really good managers and really good colleagues, uh, peers, or more experienced people. And I've also been very fortunate to work with very um, experienced and sensible sales leaders that were my partners and uh, that actually have also positively influenced me uh, mm -hmm. and developed my knowledge in terms of sales operations. So uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have more of the good than the bad. Uh, I think, you know, for sure, my first manager at BMC Software, Todd, was, was very important. We've shared the very... We had a similar background. He was also a former naval officer. So we had a lot of things in mm -hmm. common. Um, uh, and we thought very similarly. Uh, and because he was kind of my first official sales ops role in a company, obviously, he was very important. Um, but, um, you know, uh, Julie, my manager at, at uh, Quantcast, was also really, really uh, impactful. And at DocuSign, I was fortunate enough to have um, a, a first manager who was extremely experienced and extremely, he, he challenged me a lot. And I had a, a person that wasn't officially my manager, but uh, also taught me a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I had very two very strong sales ops um, leaders at DocuSign that, that really, really, um, uh, despite their experience, they, they always uh, listened to what I said. They asked me questions, I asked them was a, a very, um, it was amazing, literally. Uh, mm -hmm. It was such a learning experience for me. 
to be exposed to two people so experienced in the area and also so different at the same time and being exposed to them um, mm. on a regular basis was was incredible. Mm. I like how you refer to the sales leaders as sensible. Yes. <laughs> as if you might not get sensible sales leaders. Yes. No, I, I was very fortunate to work with uh, sensible sales <laughs> leaders who also taught me a lot, you know, mm. uh, and made my job a lot easier as well. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, right. I have like so many insights. So I'll just run through a couple. Um, I think the biggest one that we haven't heard before is how, as I mentioned, the sales reps or the A's being the CEOs with their own little business. And simply saying that to them, I I bet it would have such a great impact on their performance, right? Because then they're like, oh, actually, yeah, I am a CEO. And then they'll go back and they'll strategize and then, in theory, produce better results. So that was really cool. Um, also, the best sales of people predict the future. They don't just react to what's happening. Uh, yes. You always need a plan, whether that's plan A, B, or C. Um, challenge the status quo, and then sales ops being the most, the, the least biased uh, department in the organization. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing all of that, Chris. That was a really, really intense uh, 40 minutes, and I'm sure that all of our listeners are really going to enjoy that. My pleasure. It was great talking to you. <laughs>